Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to the uh, Ask Center program for today. We're going to wait a minute or two as people sort of come in and get settled, et cetera. And so we'll, I'll, I'll watch the participant list. And when we get up to where I think we're going to be, uh, we'll get started. So uh, relax for just a minute. And I want to thank our panelists for being here, but I will introduce them later. Hi, Latasha. Hi, y'all. I'm so sorry. Um, as you know, we're traveling. Uh oh. You're doing oh, great. Hi, Latasha. Hi, y'all. How you doing? Hi, Latasha. I'm loving the lights. We're, it's Christmas. <laughs> Hi, Latasha. We're just waiting another couple of minutes before we actually get started. So your timing is perfect. Okay, sounds great. Nan, are you at the, at the North Pole? I'm, I'm close to it. I don't, <laughs> around, I don't hang around up north a lot, so I had to get me some northern lights. <laughs> You're a mess. You're a mess. You're looking great. Well, thank you. So do you. Thank you. I don't think I've ever seen you let your hair get this long. Oh, never. I haven't been to a, haven't been to a salon. You know, there's this little thing called the pandemic. So. You're right. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. It's doing and nothing. a state that, right. <laughs> well, it's good seeing you. Oh, our pleasure. Okay, I think and we're- Okay. Um, I think we're just about ready to get started. Uh, I will introduce myself, but I'll also introduce all of you shortly. Uh, so I am Miles Rappaport, and I am the Senior Practice Fellow in American Democracy at the Ash Center of the Harvard Kennedy School. And before we start, I wanna make a few announcements on behalf of the Ash Center. Um, first being that we, the Ash Center acknowledges that Harvard is actually on the land of the Massachusetts tribe uh, people. And they are, uh, this has always been their land and the place for nation to come together. Uh, we will dedicate it, secondly, I wanna let you know, we'll dedicate a chunk of our time to answer questions that appear in the chat. So you should go in the, Q, actually in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it. And as we go forward, we will call on you for the questions, but you can submit them uh, starting now at any time. And lastly, I wanna make sure everybody knows that the event is being recorded uh, and it will be available actually on the Ash Center uh, website and YouTube site uh, after the, uh, shortly after the event. So I want to welcome everybody uh, and say that the, we are delighted, delighted may be a funny word, but we are having our discussion today uh, as we get close to the end of probably the most amazing election cycle imaginable. It's hard to describe it actually without sounding incredibly melodramatic. Um, and here's why some of what we saw was completely historic, having an election in the midst of a global pandemic having an election where everyone on all sides agreed that the stakes are high, bordering on life-changing for our country, having an election with the threat of foreign interference as an ever-present reality, having an election where the procedures were constantly changing, being improvised to fit the moment and the needs, and being challenged in the largest amount of procedural litigation ever in an election. Some of what we saw has been horrible. The efforts to restrict and undermine the vote uh, with procedural machinations around the country was, uh, was a disgrace. A constant refrain of the election being rigged and the spread of misinformation about the election throughout the process. And of course, most recently, the relentless challenges to the full and fair counting and the acceptance of the outcome of the election, including challenges to the legitimacy of the democratic process itself. But some of the ways this election has been unique have been encouraging in really important ways. So first, the overall turnout, uh, we are getting very, very close to 160 million votes or 66.7 uh, percentage of the, of the electorate. That compares with 137 million in 2016. So we're way, way over. The commitment of election officials, Democratic, Republican, and nonpartisan to do their job, and in some cases to stand up to uh, intimidation, political pressure, and even threats of violence and the resolve in almost every case of the judiciary to uphold the process as we ended it. And of course, and we'll come back to this, 
the massive efforts to register, mobilize, and educate new voters of all kinds was really, really amazing to watch. And that, of course, brings us to the state of Georgia and to our discussion today. Georgia was at the epicenter of so many of the trends this year, was one of the closest elections in the country. It had extraordinarily high rates of registration and voting. There were, in fact, efforts to suppress and discourage voting, but there was an amazing level of organization and mobilization from a, an array of democracy and community organizations around the state. And it had election officials who, in some cases, surprisingly, stood up to immense pressure to preserve the vote. And finally, it's about to have the next to last word in the 2020 election. On Tuesday, January 5th, the voters of Georgia will vote in two Senate runoff elections with the eyes of the nation and the world upon it. And while the partisan control of the US Senate is at stake, this is a nonpartisan discussion. And what we wanna focus on is not so much who will win, but how democracy is working in Georgia today. And to talk about that issue, we have three extraordinary panelists, all of whom are deeply enmeshed in the work of democracy in Georgia and in some cases around the country. I wanna thank all of you in advance for taking the time out of the critical work you're doing to talk with us today. Before I introduce the, the panelists, I just want a quick uh, second about the format. We're not gonna have like opening statements. Uh, we prefer to be in conversation. I will ask each of the panelists a, a question um, followed maybe by a follow-up question or two, and then we'll go to questions that arise from the audience. And at the very end, um, uh, I will turn back to make sure that everyone has a concluding, an opportunity to make a concluding remark. And finally, I have the sad announcement to make that Stephanie Cho, who was supposed to be with us today, uh, found out yet, you know, yesterday had a death in her family, and so she's not uh, there, but we will have a little bit of a conversation about what the AAPI vote uh, was uh, was about. So to announce that we send Stem Stephanie our sympathy and our support. Tamika Atkins, I'll introduce first. Tamika is the executive director of Pro Georgia. Pro Georgia is the nonprofit, quote, table is a term of art, uh, which is a coalition of 50 organizations in Georgia, both issue organizations and neighborhood organizations. And Pro Georgia provides them with the tools and the access and the training to be effective in their work in elections. Tamika is an extraordinary leader and coalition builder who also serves on the National Board of State Voices with me, and I'm very, very proud to, be, to have her with us. Latasha Brown has been a remarkable leader, as I think everyone knows, uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, and most recently the founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund, which has given crucial support to African-American organizations in states around the country. She's also a major voice in public national media outlets. And we at the Kennedy School are very proud that she has been uh, to have multiple connections with Latasha. She was a fellow at the Institute of Politics of the Kennedy School. She is now a Hauser leader at the Center for Public Leadership and a leader in practice with the Women in Public Policy Program all here at the Kennedy School. So Latasha, you're in familiar, familiar uh, at least a part of your familiar terrain. Lastly, Senator Nan Grogan Orock is a fixture in Georgia politics. She began her career as a civil rights activist in Georgia in the 1960s. She has represented Atlanta in the Georgia legislature for 33 years as a member of the House and now of the state Senate. Nan has been, also been a national women's rights advocate through her longtime leadership in the Women in Legislative Leadership Program. Uh, Nan and I serve together on the Center for Policy Alternatives and I am very proud to call her a friend. Okay, uh, Tamika, I'm gonna go to the first question to you, okay? By now, uh, people have begun to understand that the seeds of the remarkable shift in Georgia to Joe Biden and the Democrats were planted 10 years ago and patiently and energetically tended by organizations on the ground. As the leader of pro-Georgia, which was actually founded just about 10 years ago, uh, what can you tell us about that process and why it blossomed, to continue my garden analogy, why it blossomed in 2020? Tamika, you have the floor. All right, thank you, Miles. Um, and also just wanna send some love to both Latasha and Nan. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with you all in Seattle again. Um, so I think a couple of things. One is that, you know, 
uh, pro-Georgia, our intent was not to plant seeds for any party. Um, really, you know, we're based in the South, we're based in Georgia, where voter suppression um, and voter disenfranchisement runs rampant. And, you know, we had organizations that were uh, doing uh, their own individual work, right, from Georgia Wand, uh, focusing on environmental justice and environmental racism and connecting it with women and women issues, to Georgia Equality, uh, that was uh, their their challenge, their um, their charge was to uh, protect LGBTQ rights in Georgia and to advocate for LGBTQ folks at the state capitol. Um, to Georgia Stand Up, right? That was focused on you know making sure that working class folks in the city of Atlanta could have access to fair and equitable jobs with uh, fair wages and fair benefits. But all of these organizations were also doing voter registration and civic engagement, um, but they weren't in community with each other and in conversation with each other. Um, and so they decided nearly 10 years ago that um, they wanted to have more um, efficient and effective and coordinated voter registration and civic engagement plans. Um, but they wanted to make sure that they weren't all talking and registering. Um, having the same conversations around civic engagement with the same people, right? And so they agreed to come together and become the 12 founding organizations of Pro-Georgia. And uh, you know, what, how we do our work, we coordinate voter registration and civic engagement with local grassroots community organizations. And we use data and tools to make sure our work is effective and strategic. Right, so we use tools like the VAN, the Voter Activation Network, so that we can figure out who are new and low propensity voters. So who are the people that no party is talking to? Who are the people who are invisibilized and marginalized, right? And how do we make sure that they have access to our democracy? Because frankly, if, if our democracy isn't representative of all of its eligible citizens, then what are we doing? right? Um, then that means that all voices aren't heard. And so through our collective actions, Pro-Georgia and their partners have been able to register primarily Black and Brown people um, across the state of Georgia, uh, focusing in Metro Atlanta, Southwest Georgia, and then along the coast in Chatham County. In 2016, we were able to register over 83,000 uh, new voters uh, collectively. Uh, and we, uh, in 2016, our universe of people was about 330,000 people that we talked to multiple times, multiple touches from uh, text to phone to door and to what we call site-based canvassing. And that meant pre-pandemic, right? At, you know, train stations, bus stations, places where uh, folks are gathering any uh, um, together already. And in 2016, the voter turnout for the state of Georgia was 60%. For our universe of voters that we talked to, our rate of turnout was 67%. And that is pretty significant. Again, proving that, you know, multiple conversations, right? doing integrated voter engagement. So that means don't show up in September, right? And um, register people to vote and then disappear, but actually be a part of with, move with the community year round, right? And working with trusted messengers that it works, right? So our partner organizations are out there providing direct services, leadership development, community organizing, uh, like, uh, you know, since the pandemic, some of our partners have provided food pantry and COVID testing sites. And in the course of drive up, socially distance, of course, um, to, to pick up food, right, from their uh, self-start food pantries, civic engagement materials are included um, in the conversation. So it's, it's that kind of wraparound and looking at people and looking at our communities, not as a vote and not as a transactional relationship, but really like deep investment in our communities. Now that kind of work takes time. Now it bears fruit, but it takes time and it's a long-term investment. And so what you are seeing in Georgia right now with, and I wanna focus on with the record turnout that we are experiencing, right? That is, that is the work of at least a decade of primarily black and brown leaders being present in the community year round and including voter registration and their overall organizing work. Great. Thank you very, very much. And we'll hear more from you shortly. Um, uh, this second question is for Latasha. Latasha is the movement for black lives and black lives and black voters matter have had an unbelievable impact, not only in the election, but in the nation's conversation and consciousness as a whole. Um, focusing on Georgia, how did all of that energy 
translate to the vote in Georgia in, in 2020. Um, By the way, I see you you're on a bus or something. So you're, I am. You know, let everybody know that, that Latasha's in the middle of a bus tour around Georgia. So we're really getting it straight from the uh, uh, from the bus's mouth, so to speak. <laughs> That's right. You are. I, we are hot on the campaign trail. Matter of fact, we are pulling up right now to one of the places in Valdosta, Georgia, because we do have a campaign going on, y'all, and we are trying to win. We're using every minute. Um, but I am on the Black Voters Matter bus, so so I may be moving a little bit. But you know, I, thank you, Miles, for uh, for that question. I just want to say good morning to my Harvard family, my Kennedy School family. Um, it's great to see everybody here, and to my movement um, and social justice in Georgia family that that's on this call. You know, I think it's really important. You know, when we talk about kind of the nexus of kind of the Black Lives Matter and Black Voters Matter. But look, if we put the titles of, uh, uh, to the side, what is this really about? What this is really about is an affirming message that humanity matters, right? That the lives of black people, that in many ways in this country as a result of structural racism, and in many ways in this country that we've seen state sanctioned violence, right? That that has not been respected or even actually acknowledged or even affirmed. So in our community, we wanted to affirm that ourselves, that black lives in fact matter, right? And so in that process, I think what you saw in the movement is you see the, you see the political dynamics of the movement of their particular request and policy, but at the core of this is around people matter and black people, you know, who have, who were brought to this country enslaved and treated um, and even seen as less than human. That, that there still is a vestige of that that lives in every single system in this country. And we're rejecting that notion. And so what we are doing is affirming ourselves in that statement, right? And I think it's something that's powerful when a people affirms themselves, right? It affirms all of us that at the end of the day, I love to see other people authentically be who they are because what it does is it opens up a space and gives permission for all of us to celebrate the beauty of who we are in our humanity. And so part of where there is a political context to this movement for the Black Lives Matter movement that quite frankly, is part of the birthing of Black Voters Matter. You know, Cliff Albright and I started this organization in 2016. And so he and I have been doing work together on some form of fashion for the last two and a half decades. We've been doing social justice work. Both of us started and met um, with our third partner, um, um, April Albright, uh, in Alabama. And we were doing this work. And we've always worked on campaigns. We worked on scores and scores of campaigns. We've done everything in the political spectrum from, like, I, I was the girl that was responsible for picking up the chicken boxes on election day to actually going and running for a statewide office. And so all along the political spectrum, we've actually had some kind of engagement or access point. And for years, we would talk about this need to actually have an organization that can act, could build the infrastructure and support um, of black independent political power that was not really just um, rooted in, a, centered around a political candidate or a political party, right? Because both of the, they both have an agenda. Candidates, political candidates have an agenda and parties have an agenda. And in and, and best case scenario, there's an alignment between the community's agenda and their agenda. But you all know that that's not always the case. So what we wanted to do is really be able to center and root our work in a way that it gave some level of credence around an independent political platform so that communities could really be self-determined and literally start creating the kind of political landscape that would produce different candidates or even that the people who were in office would respond differently and even the political campaigns would respond differently and so all of that work while all we have been talking about that work and doing a lot of that work you know black lives matter movement kind of forced us to sit back and reevaluate as movements always do. Movements make you start thinking about, am I doing enough? You know, and even at, with a lot of the work that we were doing, we were forced to sit and reflect if there was something we could do more. You know, if all of the work that we've been doing, could we do more? And so both he and I, um, realized that our skill that there was a need and we had a certain level of we had a certain um certain level of skills that we could bring to the table around both of us had worked in philanthropy both of us had uh, worked on institution building both of us had been organizers and so we wanted to really be able to bring our skills our think our collective thinking together and really be able to build this organization 
but it was the impetus of that in many ways um, we were birthed out of kind of indirectly of the Black Lives Matter movement. It was that movement that called us to consciousness. It was that movement that said, yes, we have to do more. It was that movement that said, we think this movement is a powerful movement and we want to contribute to it. And what is a way for us to contribute to it? And we decided that our path is that because both of us were political operatives and political strategists, that we would literally direct our resources, our thinking, our time and energy to literally building out a organization that could actually help strengthen the infrastructure of community black led grassroots groups that were on the ground. And so that's kind of where the nexus of how the Black Lives Matter movement, how our work kind of grew out of that. Um, as we go forward, as we see what we're working with now, I think that it is a ultimate question um, and part of that underlines our work around what is the future of democracy? You know, in many ways, we have been in denial in this country, that we have all hidden behind American exceptionalism, that in some way democracy has already been achieved. Democracy is aspirational in this country at best. Yes, there are certainly elements of democracy. There is a framework of democracy, and there's some democrat democratic processes, voting being one of them, right, that, in exi that are in existence. But also, I think in this moment, we have all experienced um, the fragility of democracy, right? And so what is it that's needed in order for us to strengthen democracy? It is what is really needed, what protects democracy is democracy. <laughs> Are people engaging in the process? And so part of our work um, has been driven in, around this notion of two, two values of love and power. How can we create and build organization and infrastructure that can build out and support the ecosystem to build capacity of black led groups on the ground in a way that literally is led by love not divisiveness not hatred not in in otherizing folks but literally stand firmly in who we are and literally have an invitation that all that literally align themselves with our values right that that's who we're in that's who we're in allyship with. That is who we're working with. And so what you see happen in Georgia is precisely that. You see what, what Reverend Jesse Jackson, um, who is constantly, I'm constantly co talking to him and learning from him around this notion of the Rainbow Coalition, that there could be a coalition in this country, in the South in particular, that would be made up and anchored by uh, people of color, that would be Black folks, um, Asian American and Pacific Islanders, that the LGBTQ community, white people, um, indigenous people, that literally collectively, that we are the majority in this country and even in the region and that when we work together and we show up in our, the fullness of who we are and tap into our energy and our community that we can make a change. And so part of that is actually the spirit of the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, racism allows this whole Black Lives Matter conversation to get, in my opinion, boxed in right just boxed in like a political hashtag when in fact it is a movement but it's not just a movement around the affirming of black lives it actually is a movement around the affirming of one's humanity and everybody should be able to see themselves in that movement which is why i think this past year when we saw the uprisings um in in this country what you saw is the largest uprisings ever in the united states and if you looked at it was literally led by young black people but when you look at every single state had an uprising when you look at the intergenerational and the interracial nature because there was something about the truth and one affirming themselves right that actually opens up the space for us all to see a sense of affirming our own selves and our own power wow thank you very much uh, um, amazing amazing commentary all right nan i'm going to come to you uh senator Orock, i should say uh, it's amazing that you have served in the Georgia legislature for so long and you have seen over those years a lot of changes and also a lot of resistance to change. As you watched that history unfold, and particularly this year, what perspective can you share as a leading elected official in the state of Georgia? Thank you, Miles. It's a pleasure to, to be here and to join by my fellow panelists and uh, learn from every sentence that's coming out of their mouths. Uh, the, 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 they're, they're, they're both tremendous leaders uh, in Georgia and recognized nationally. And uh, I'm just, uh, I'm honored to be uh, among the ranks. Um, and we've, uh, we've all known each other for a long, long time. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a new day, darling. 
uh, but it had but its roots go way back. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a long timer. Uh, John Lewis and I were elected in the same election. He endorsed me and has now gone to his final uh, rest, but I'm I'm still around and uh, uh, we, we were, remained compatriots because we were in SNCC together. That's how far back we went uh, and he was the chair of SNCC. But moving forward, when I, I was elected uh, and came into the legislature at a time when I was serving with people who had put uh, Lester Maddox in the governor's mansion. Uh, I was, sir, I was uh, sworn in with a flag over the state capitol that was the stars and bars of the old Confederacy. Um, and uh, it was a, a, a state ruled by the Southern Democrats and they always made, they weren't national Democrats, they were Southern Democrats and we all knew what that meant. And so I was a real outlier as a progressive from uh, uh, downtown Atlanta and particularly with my uh, background in history uh, uh, in the civil rights struggle. Again, uh, that mass movement that informs everything that we're speaking about today and where we are, I think, as a, as a state and as a nation. So um, I, I was there as the, as the, as the Democrats tra tra tracked even further to the right. Uh, racism uh, and, and the debate around race, I was, uh, have, have always been, has always been prevalent. And I was there when, uh, when, when Democrats were standing up and saying, why that flag is not racist, uh, that's just honoring our uh, heritage. And that's why we put that in in the 50s uh, to, to wave over the state capitol. So that, that history that, that I've uh, witnessed and been a part of uh, goes back to some pretty, uh, pretty dismaying times. But we have seen where we uh, have arrived through relentless struggle. We have a true progressive movement uh, in Georgia that is palpable and that is delivering. And um, everybody knows that, Miles, you framed it so well, where we are now going into the last uh, 25 days of this election uh, to, towards this uh, pivotal question of who's going to control the U.S. Senate. Uh, and we, we, didn't, we didn't get there uh, by accident. There's been very conscious and deliberate, and, and both uh, Tamika and Latasha have, have, have referenced this and reflected, uh, deliberate building of an infrastructure in this state. Um, a, 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 the, the type of coalition that pro-Georgia uh, represents. Um, incredibly important and, and made measurable difference from the, as soon as it got on the ground, you could see the precincts that they worked in those early days. Uh, would, 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 would show a turnout of like 14% increase uh, in, the, in, the, in the voters uh, in these targeted precincts, because you've always uh, watched the metrics uh, to make a, a pro George has always done that. And you see, we benefited from the national movement because Colorado had a, 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 a big success of turning more progressive and they, they popularized that model uh, and it grew into the state table model. Uh, that uh, is now pro Georgia. Let me let me say, uh, critically important is the progressive the role that progressive philanthropy played. And I'm I'm a part of the Sapelo Foundation, um, and Sapelo decide and it's a, it's a state it's a state foundation, a family foundation here in Georgia, only funds in Georgia, and it and and we decided that we were going to bring that state state table model to Georgia and fund it and grow it. And we've, we're funding it to this day, uh, uh, some uh, uh, 10 or more years uh, further. And it has grown and, and amplified and you just heard the, the, where, where it's been taken. Uh, critically important, one piece of the infrastructure that, that's, that's being built and the pulling to bringing together of uh, all, all of these allies. Uh, oh. and, and again, the incredible leadership out of uh, the black community in particular. And let us let us reflect that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, Stacey Abrams, I don't know if, if we've talked this long about Georgia before without bringing up her name, but we're sure gonna bring it up now. She came into the legislature and brought her leadership, brought her perspective, her strategy. And that went from being a minority point of view that was poo-pooed by the old line uh, crowd here to becoming the winning formula. And that is to mobilize, get out and reach and engage 
uh, and mobilize the the uh, forgotten folks all across the state and and build a, a, an alliance, get out get out there year round. And you described it very well, Tamika. Get out there year round and work with with the, the voters who haven't been invited to the table, who've been taken for granted, who haven't been reached at all and have, have not voted. And so we under, we, 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 Georgia was the first state that put in a voter ID, 2005. Uh, the Democrats walked out uh, 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 of the Senate at that point to, to, as a protest. And that has been a relentless fact in this state is that we've had to fight, fight, fight for the access to the ballot. And that's pretty well, well documented, but that battle has gone on and it's really energized people. Uh, to, if you don't want us to vote, there must be a reason you don't want us to vote. So we're going to get out here and bring that vote. And we, we've done it in uh, with record numbers and we've done it with the, the nonprofits. Uh, civic engagement has been, uh, uh, is a, there are an array of groups, a broad array of groups that uh, uh, are out here mobilizing the sleeping giant, and and the the point of view that uh, Stacey Abrams brought is that there's a there's a new American uh, majority out here, and it's it's uh, springs from the the communities of color, the people of color, uh, youth, uh, women, uh, immigrants, the the new American voters, and that's the that's the um, and 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 pro and progressive thinking, right minded white people are a critical part of that as well, and 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 she. She took that and went out across the state with that point of view that we've got to build that voice and mobilize that muscle. And she had the vision and the capacity to raise truly enormous uh, sums of money to fund this uh, continued building out of, of uh, infrastructure, uh, which has included PACs as, as well as nonprofits and, and of course, candidacies. And, and um, that has brought us, uh, in, you know, in short, to the, the place where we are today, where we have, where we the epicenter of the political universe. It didn't happen, it didn't, it didn't happen by accident. Uh, and, and, and the um, outpouring into the streets, the uprising as Latasha so, act, act, uh, out, you know, so, so tellingly characterized it, this uprising, this uprising was reflected here in Georgia as well. And we have, we are uh, virtually headed towards a majority minority state. Uh, uh, and we have a 32% African American population uh, and growing, uh, along with uh, the growing uh, uh, communities of the Asian American Pacific Islanders, uh, Latina, huge growth of Latinas. Uh, we became the, one of the fastest growing states with Latina population starting in 1996. But th this this uh, this vision of building alliance, working, uh, fund funding, and and uh, growing the infrastructure to move this state forward and to tackle the huge battles which we're in as we speak right now, Natasha and Tamika can tell you as well, we're battling right now for access to the ballot. That, that never stops. And we had, uh, huge, we've had huge battles uh, and they're gonna come back, they're coming back at us in the next session. They're gonna try to restrict absentee ballots and uh, restrict drop boxes, and there's a number of of uh, plans under uh, underfoot to that are moving forward to actually continue to uh, shut down access to the ballot. So we're the battle is joined, and uh, the uh, the outpouring of uh, energy and enthusiasm is incredible. One organization, Fair Fight Action, well combined with the candidates, but we we they've got. We've got 10,000 volunteers, 10,000 volunteers. This is epic. And, uh, and we're being supported uh, all across the country. Uh, and uh, we're, we're confident that this model of grassroots mobilization, uh, year round contact with the voters, lifting up uh, and following the leadership of people of color coming from the communities across this state uh, and building that strong alliance that uh, we're on the road, we're on the road to a new day in Georgia. And I've been privileged to be in that legislature and see and work on and, you know, be in the battle, be in the battle, be in the trenches on uh, pushing this uh, forward in this state where my father was born, a son of a sharecropper, 12 kids down in South Georgia. Uh, 
history and uh, and the, and, the, and the shared history. We know the Hank Sanders and the Rose Sanders. The, we did, we go back generations. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Latasha. Uh, uh, you, you came out of the 21st century leadership program. They were my mentors, both of them were my mentors. Exactly. Hey, was my exactly. And Rose, my activist mentor. That's right. And from out Selma, yeah. Alabama. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying. So these roots go back to the struggles of the '60s. You know, we're in a mighty river, flowing, of fighting to actualize democracy in this country. It brings you to tears when you think of the lives that have been put on the line and the countless struggles and sacrifices uh, to bring us to where we are today. And we can do nothing but hold up the freedom banner and move forward. Great, thank you. Tamika, I wanna come back to you. Uh, as, as you know, we were planning to have Stephanie Cho here to talk about the uh, AAPI community and it, the Asian American community and how it impacted the race. Uh, could you talk just a little bit? I know that the Pro Georgia represents lots and lots of different groups and communities, and that the Asian American Pacific Islander community is one of them. Were they impactful in the in the 2020 elections? Uh, hi, thank you, Miles. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, you know, I think a couple of things. One is that um, from 2012 to 2018, uh, the number of eligible Asian American and Pacific Islander voters in Georgia grew about 47%. Um, and there are right now about uh, 250,000 uh, uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders who are eligible to vote. And in this election so far, about a little under 17,000 uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have already voted. Um, and that is work that has been done over the last decade by some of our partners, like Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta, uh, Center for Pan-Asian Community Services, CPACs Up North, um, and then, you know, some of our other uh, organizations that work primarily with immigrant communities, the Latinx communities like Aleo, Georgia Association for Latino Elected Officials, Latino Community Fund, and um, a few others. And, you know, so a couple of things. One is that, um, and again, this is pre-pandemic, right? But this is why being a trusted messenger matters because when you have to pivot in a pandemic from being able to have face-to-face in-person conversations that are really more, the most effective thing you can do is connect to people. Um, I think like Latasha said, to meet their humanity, you can do that when you look people in the eye and have conversations with them. To have this kind of year where we have to pivot to mostly digital and phone bank because communities already know our partners, already in uh, ongoing relationships with our partners, um, we were able to activate Right and um and 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 utilize that reservoir of trust that's already been built with communities, right? Um, to have to do the outreach and civic engagement this year to encourage folks to go out and vote. Um, but at Pro Georgia, we have something called the New Americans Work Group, um, and it's that particular work group that actually the Sapelo Foundation um has funded um for the last several years. And our partners, uh, we go to nearly every naturalization ceremony in the state of Georgia and register recently naturalized citizens to vote. Um, and again, it's, it's typically organizations like AAAJ, CPACs, uh, Galeo, Georgia Muslim Voter Project that lead on that work. Um, and to this date, we now, um, prior to 2021, we had reached about 7,500 uh, uh, recently naturalized citizens that we had registered to vote per year for the last uh, six years. Um, and again, you know, so we are registering them to vote. We're photocopying their citizenship uh, certificate with their permission. And then we are submitting their voter registration application on their behalf. And what we found in 2018 was that some of the folks that we registered in this through this process were getting flags on their records or they were being put on the pending list due to citizenship status, which meant that somebody wasn't opening the package and processing all of the, the information correctly if your certificate that says you're recently naturalized is right there in the packet. Um, and it was in 2018 that we, along with several other partners, um, including a New Georgia Project and Asian Americans Advancing Justice, to name a few, that's when we uh, partnered with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law and did um, the exact match lawsuit. Because it is under the, uh, the exact match rule, which is the matching signature, um, that is a, uh, it's the exact match, and if your name doesn't match, that has disproportionately affected African Americans and other communities of color. In 2018, 70% of the people on the exact match list, or I'm sorry, on the pending list 
were African American. And we look at this as voter suppression, right? Rightly so. Um, and, um, and it's an attempt to discourage us from voting. And I think most recently, Black Voters Matter is a part of a recent lawsuit about um, the, the ongoing of uh, purges that are happening because again it is just disproportionately black and brown people who are purged now you know so not only are we present by registering recently naturalized citizens you know uh, asian americans advancing justice they have worked with the growing asian american community in georgia um and you know one example of that is you know uh in 20, 2012, around 2011 to 2012, our partners who already work within those communities, they saw a movement. They saw people moving geographically to Gwinnett County, to Duluth and Norcross area. Um, and so that meant that either organizations were opening offices in those areas, they were sending organizers up to those areas so that they continue, can continue to provide the services, the community services from English as a second language to you know, naturalization uh, uh, courses like one-on-one -on -one to help folks you know, complete the paperwork to legal services, right? Um, AAAJ hires several attorneys, right? To advocate for the rights um, of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Georgia. And you know that work, that that pivot to Gwinnett County. That's work that uh, our partners did before anyone. And by anyone, I mean that's before the campaigns, that's before the candidates, and that's before the PACs and the C4 were interested in investing um, in the turnout of communities of color of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Gwinnett County, in um, the Northeast part of the city. And what we then saw was in 2016, just um, one of the outcomes, right, of this, of this work, of this groundwork, right? Again, because you gotta do the work years in advance. Um, Gwinnett County, for the first time in recorded history, voted for the most progressive candidate on the ticket. And right, and that's my C3 way of discussing the work, one of the outcomes, right? Um, and you know, we always say that that is what it looks like to do integrated voter engagement and show up four years before. So when people are still talking about, um, well, the percentage of those voters there um, is just too small to matter, or their community doesn't vote regularly, um, right? It, you know, again, it's moving from seeing individuals in, in a transactional nature. You know, we won't get our win number if we, you know, we can't. Like this is why you have to do integrated voter engagement why you have to do voter registration and civic engagement through community organizations because it bears fruit after a while, you know? Um, and so mm -hmm. that work has continued, right? Those partners are still leading the work. Um, and at this point, organizations like Asian Americans Advancing Justice, they've now grown to develop C4, right? They have C4 arms to their work. And, you know, one of the funnest campaigns was um, 2018 Asians for Abrams. Right. Um, and they had all the swag and all the gear, you know, and, you know, they are very clear about connecting the Asian American and Pacific Islander community to a larger um, shared struggle. Right. For transformation and for liberation in Georgia. Right. That they are part of a larger community of color. And, and we are using these relationships. Right. And this and this kind of like this political organizing that we've been doing uh, to prepare us for 2021 for gerrymandering and redistricting. Right when it comes time for us to start building um, uh, uh, communities of color as we draw districts, right? Um, what does it look like for us to say that we are a shared district, particularly in Gwinnett County, where uh, there is a high density of African American, Latinx, and Asian American communities? All right. Well, that was great. Thank you. Listen, I've been looking at the at the at the questions in the Q and A and the chat, and they sort of fall. There's a few outliers, but they all many of them fall into two categories. And uh, Latasha, I'm going to go to you for the first one, which is what are you seeing in terms of uh, at efforts at voter suppression and, you know, how and how are you fighting back? And the second question on the table is whether there will be runoff and there's often fall off between the runoff election you know, held later and the November election. Do we expect to see the kind of turnout uh, in the end, at the end of the day? January 5th that we saw in let's let's make sure we don't miss it don't let the the vote suppression off the hook Natasha. tell us what uh, what are you doing not let the voter suppression I think I want to start question first um and can y'all hear me because I know we're moving yes okay. we can I go out um I want to start with 
you know, a, around the vote, what our expectation is of the vote. I do want to give people some context, you know, and Nan can actually speak to this. I just want y'all to know how much I love Nan or Rock. I love Nan or Rock, but I'll, I'm going to come back and, and, and talk about that. Um, um, cause of her, her broader work. Um, if you are to be, a, if you are an elected, uh, position, you know, there are very few people that I know that put themselves in a position that they are serving and they are literally taking direction and an alignment. And Nan is one of those folks. She is a, an absolute gem to Georgia. So I just want to lift that up. But, um, uh, but, but the second thing is I want to talk j just to share around what to expect, but I do want to give some context, right? Because sometimes we have an expectation and not really realize what people are really working through. And just to give us some c context of how what is happening in, in, in Georgia right now is so extraordinary. The whole runoff process, and Ann can, um, Nan can speak to this better than I can, was actually established. It was almost like a part of the Southern strategy. It was established to give Republicans an advantage white elite candidates an advantage in the election because they knew there would be a drop off for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, normally when we've uh, allowed uh, uh, elections to really be very candidate centered is the candidate who has the most money, who is a candidate that can actually spend the resources to get their base out. It's normally a runoff election is usually decided. Now it's almost like kind of electoral college um, and the popular vote, right? In the general election, you got the popular vote. In electoral college, you have a smaller elite group of, of electors that make a decision. The runoff was, was actually created almost in that same kind of spirit and that same kind of thinking that fundamentally that you would have this general election, you would have the election, but then the runoff, you would actually only be, you would attract the super voters, which would be elite, a elite group of voters um, who were um, didn't deal with, uh, many of them um, were more advantaged to be able to take uh, take advantage of that opportunity and vote. And so it was literally created as a vehicle to marginalize poor voters and voters of color. So let's start with that context. Given that, knowing that in a runoff, there's a severe drop off, um, given that the, the, the level and the scale of voter suppression, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in the state of Georgia, given that on the first day of, of, of early voting in the state of Georgia, 41% of the voters to come out and vote on the early voting were black voters. Now we're only 32% of the population, which means that we actually overperformed. But in addition to that, when you look at the numbers in the last two days of who's performed, there have been more people who have voted in the runoff election then have voted in the general election. That is extraordinary. I, I do want people to understand how extraordinary that is, that not in addition to the barriers, but in the fact that there's, there's all kinds of factors. The factor that you don't have the top of the ticket that everybody said was drive the ticket. Trump, well, technically you don't have him at the top of the ticket. You, um, um, you also don't have that many candidates where you had a slate of candidates. Now you literally only have a US Senate race and there is a public service commission race on there as well that we haven't been talking a lot about, but that's it. So you don't have the draw in the pool of multiple campaigns, organizing and engaging people to come and participate in the ballot, in the vote. And you don't have the same kind of energy of the national, um, the national election happening on coming. But the fact that there have been more people to vote in these first two days is indicative to something, right? And I also think that is reflective of not necessarily just on the impact of this election, but it's also indicative to the work that both myself, Tamika and Nan are doing that is related to there, there is a party of people that we are taking democracy in our own hands. We're not waiting on the political candidates or the parties. God bless them. We support them. We want them to do well. We want them to run amazing campaigns. I saw I saw some commercials. Uh, we're not commercials. I was like, those are the best commercials. They are fantastic, right? But we're not leaving it up to the candidates. I mean, that's been part of what I think has been a part of the fragility of democracy and the devolution of democracy has been because we've approached it as like a proxy that if, if in, in, in essence, you know, there's a candidate that has to inspire us or incite us. Um, and then literally that's, we're going to go out and we're going to vote. That's how it happens. There's three points that I want to make to that one, um, around some of the myths around voting. Um, one, there's this myth that voting is literally about participation and not power. 
And so Black Voters Matter, we shift our perspective around how we're talking to people, even in this election, that it's not just about you just voted for this candidate or the boogeyman is going to get you, right? That we, we're even going beyond that this isn't just about the national framework of whether the Democrats or Republicans um, are in power, even though that has implications, right? We understand that. But that you, that you as a voter of Georgia, you have something at stake. And so our conversation is leading for making sure that there's an indigenous conversation, a homogeneous conversation around voting and why this particular election. The truth of the matter is most folks in the country don't even know who their U.S. senator is, right? Other than the top characters, it's not a, it is probably, in my opinion, the most unknown, powerful position in this country. It is singly a very powerful position, but the majority of Americans cannot tell you who their U.S. Senator is. It's not a high profile position other than for people like us as political junkets. Yes, we know. But the average person, you they, you might say a name, they're like, yeah, yeah, I think that's our senator, right? And so even that in itself is extraordinary. So one of the one of the one of the myths, I think, is really centered around this notion that we have to always operate from this perspective of getting people to vote around the, the the participation that we need more to participate no it has to be driven by something else it's for us we had we're driving it with a message and i think all of us have been driving it with the message that we personally have something to state as a collective community and the state of georgia not just the nation yes we want to save the nation yes 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 we do but we want to save georgia right because we've got some problems in georgia that's the first thing the second thing you know that that I, that I want to raise is there's this this there's this notion that part of what drives turnout the thing that drives turnout in some instances has been um, it, it's it's been positioned as if the the only thing that drives turnout is having this charismatic um, attractive candidate. Let me say that absolutely matters, right? When you have an exciting candidate, someone like a Stacey Abrams, right? Or a Barack Obama, it absolutely makes a difference. But let me let me say why I'm gonna dispel kind of even that myth. In the state of Georgia, you know, we had record turnout for um, um, Barack Obama, but more black folks voted for Joe Biden than Barack Obama. Now, Joe Biden may be a nice man, but certainly we don't think that he's more exciting as a candidate to black voters in the state of Georgia than Barack Obama. So that in itself says that this theory, you know, that that reduces black folk, that the only thing that they're that we're moving on um, as black voters is personality, that that in itself, I'm hoping that we've dispelled that and disrupted that, that fundamentally there's something else that's driving if you have more people in a state like Georgia that voted for a Joe Biden than a, than a Barack, um, um, uh, Barack Obama. And the third and the last piece that I'll say even kind of related to this is this notion that you can just automatically think that it's a fall off on some of the elections. I would say that there's a lot of elections that have been lost because we have not, we have underestimated the power of people and what it means to invest in people. And so we've changed our investment strategy. For example, there are millions of dollars. There has been a consulting class that we, we're gonna have to talk about. There's been a political consulting class that's actually the billions of dollars around money um, and we, we can talk about campaign finance reform. That's another, that's another panel, right? But the billions of dollars that are going into um, uh, political campaigns are all being directed by the consultant class. And a lot of that money is going, what I say, in an air war opposed to a ground war, which is literally put all your money on TV. Um, matter of fact, I, I'm political and I've stopped watching network TV and I'm watching uh, Netflix because I feel like the commercials are taking over my life, right? And so the way that we watch TV is different, and set, but there's still this notion that where the money should go is in the TV. So let's, let me say the difference. So while the Republicans are spending millions of dollars on negative ads, guess what we're doing? We're taking our hundreds of thousands and dollars, we're taking our dollars and we're actually investing it back in community. We are literally doing events this week Right, that to recognize that folks are in, have in COVID-19 right now and that we're seeing them not just as a their vote, but as a whole person. There are people who are struggling right now. And so what we've been doing over 5,000 families, we fed for, um, um, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, we're providing groceries. 
Christmas groceries, not to whether you voted or not. We don't, that's that's not, we're not making that a requirement. What we're saying is because we care about you and care about the people of Georgia and we recognize that your whole person, that we're actually doing events all around the states. We're at one today where we're literally got people lined up that we're uh, 500 people that we're providing groceries to. We got Soul Santa and y'all, we got the real Soul Santa. But anyway, I'm, I'm, hopefully I might be able to get him to come through in a minute. Um, who's actually, we're providing toys, we're providing voting information, um, and we're actually telling, we're right at a space where people can go early vote, we're encouraging people to early vote. The reason why that is important is because we like to separate politics out as a science, as if it's not connected to people. And so what we have found is that when you are, when you're campaigning in a way that people can see in your actions, that you value them, that they can see in your actions that you care about the whole being, it has a different kind of impact on really being able to build a base. And so for our, instead of us giving millions and millions of dollars to networks, we're gonna take our millions of dollars and we're gonna put it on the ground. We're gonna invest in organizers. We're gonna invest in, yes, we do our data and that kind of stuff as well. But literally instead of taking, like think about it, instead of taking a hundred dollars to give something to, to buy a piece of paper that somebody's gonna throw out in their mail what about if that hundred dollars were you could be used in a way that actually was invested back into the voter right they themselves so that literally we could see and experience the power of collectively looking out for each other and the benefit of that and what we found that that's been an effective strategy like one doesn't not it's not necessarily contingent upon the other but we think that they work in concert with each other that when you show up up. I love to say this that you know it's kind of like the friend that you have that only shows up when they want something you're not excited to see that friend but that friend of yours that actually shows up and acknowledges when you're going through when there's something happening to your community there's community credibility in that there's relationship in that and the one thing that I have found that is super super hard even when the campaign has more money right you can't really buy love that way and relationships and so our relationships on the ground have been invaluable but that's because we've showed up in a way that we put people even over the politics and that the politics becomes a means to an end and not an end in itself hey and is uh, as latasha described is all that gonna end up in a really big turnout come january 5th what are you what are you seeing well, we have, you know the the voting's going on now early voting started uh Monday, and we've uh, outstripped, matched or outstripped the early voting numbers that showed up uh, in, on December the 3rd, yeah, on the in the general election, which is phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, and that, that those, those numbers, uh, more absentee ballots, actually absentee ballots were requested over, over a million uh, before we even got into the early voting. So, there's um, there's strong indication that we're gonna it's gonna be um, uh, again again record turnout and and you've got huge disarray the Republicans are in a circular firing circle uh, uh, debating about whether Biden won Georgia or not and why don't we call a special session and pick our own electors we've been through that whole thing threatening elected officials we all are getting uh, thousands of uh, emails from the folks that. Uh, follow uh the current president and um and 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 so they're there but but they're we and you've all seen the, the secretary of state and the governor being attacked by the president so there is a it's, it's like which side are you on so there's all this mixed messaging going on uh and and i say let the, let let the, let them keep on fighting each other we're busy uh turning out uh the vote uh I, it's really exciting to me that uh, that latasha and the black Voters Matter bus is down in Valdosta, you know, a few miles away from Florida. I mean, that's a long way from Atlanta, uh, and 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 there's there's great there's a great population turnout possibilities down there. Uh, you're you're really seeing you're seeing it in the flesh here, a lot live from Valdosta, Georgia. All right, well, this is great. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I want to make sure that I I keep my promise to let all of you have a, a last word that, uh, what is it that you wanna really, really uh, leave people with? Uh, Tamika, how about you? You know, I wanna leave people with, um, this is not overnight work. We have to trust that we know what our communities need. You know, we have to trust that, you know, um, 
we want to build long-term sustainable power for black and brown folks. We actually want to transform our communities. We want to transform policies. We want to transform politics so that it's not business as usual in the state of Georgia. Um, and in order to do that, we have to trust. We have to trust people to know they know what they need. And I know it's not so simple, but we have to trust leaders. You know, I think we, we, we encounter a lot of times um, uncertainty about how we uh, do the work, how we build with voters, how we invest in communities, right? And I think like Latasha was saying, it is a strategy. And we have to understand, and other folks have to understand, even if you don't understand the strategy, it doesn't mean it's not a strategy. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have value and it doesn't mean that it will not reap rewards at the end. Um, and so I think about political campaigns in Georgia. I think about uh, prior uh, races where $30 million are put into state for the party. Um, and for the candidate, but very little is put into, I think, you know, in a district that is at least 30% people of color, uh, uh, not 30% of the funds were put in to increase their turnout, right? So that means there was no real money for, you know, Spanish language, radio, um, local um, in-language newspapers for ads, right? And so, right, we just have to trust that leaders who are doing civic engagement on the ground know what they need. And we have to start investing differently, right, with a more of a long-term plan for 10 years and 20 years down the line. This is not overnight work. Great. Uh, Nan, how about you? Do you have a kind of... Sure. I, I would say um, if, if you haven't understood it already from all the comments that have been made, uh, investing in... Uh, 501c3s that are doing the hard work on the ground in the communities, uh, the, the relational uh, approach to uh, giving people the opportunity of a lifetime, that's to stand up and have your voice heard and be a part of, a, of a, uh, an ally to massive change that's coming our way. And I, I, I so, so that that's very important. There are those in the in the uh, world of philanthropy who've thought they can't fund something that looks like civic engagement. That's too political nonsense. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are today in Georgia if we hadn't built out that in infrastructure and funded funded it, and it continues to need funding. Um, uh, the other th the other final thing I'd say is. Uh, all of this conversation uh, is, 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 we are marked by the shadow of the plantation. And that is, those of us who've grown up and worked here in the deep south, uh, you know, we, we know it in our bones. Uh, the, we're, in a, we're in a new time where the nation is challenged to have a reckoning and an honest conversation and take concrete steps. Uh, around the baked in white supremacy uh, uh, un under which, which has marked this nation since its inception. Uh, and so that, that is an integral part of this battle for uh, full democracy. And, and there's incredible leadership. You've heard from uh, two leaders right here in Georgia, uh, giving voice to that and doing the work and look for the opportunities to support this kind of effort to be a part of this conversation and uh, of the activism that will take us where we must go. Thanks. Latasha, I think I'll give you the last word. I'll be brief. Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold, hold on, on, hold on. on. That's right. We got to hold on, y'all. I will say this, particularly since we are talking in the Kennedy School. You know, the Kennedy School has been instrumental in terms of turning out leaders who are actually shaping the policy on the forefront of shaping policy in this country. We have to act, recognize that voter suppression isn't this one thing that happened to the people of Georgia. I think it's kind of poetic that the very people two years ago that were at ground zero of voter suppression are now the very people who are driving, um, driving the democracy movement right now for all of us. And so I think we all also have to really be able to recognize that we're at this transformative moment yeah. that in this moment right now it's almost like the three third reconstruction we have gone through a lot in this country but i don't know the in my lifetime as i've ever witnessed a anti-democracy -dem movement 
to the extent that we're seeing right now. There was always this kind of this structure racism, but there is a full-fledged anti-democracy movement that is taking hold in this country that's being led by the current president. That's right. That's telling people not to count votes, y'all, that are showing up saying, we've got senators that are calling down to Georgia, telling people and telling the folks in Georgia what to do to really be able to disrupt the, 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 the race. That's I'm right. reading this because we have to really recognize, unfortunately, American exceptionalism also helps us to fall asleep and not to really understand when we're on the edge, the edge of fa fascism, it is not over. Right, and I can go on, right. and on and on to talk about vote suppression. It is not over, but we have to recognize that there is an anti-democracy movement happening in this country. And so we have to respond by yes. not just elections, but building a comprehensive national pro-democracy movement that we are strengthening, for forcing our senators, our Congress folks to create legislation that is actually going to protect expand and strengthen democracy in this country one of the, one of the things that i often talk about it all and i'll I, I said i was gonna be brief and i guess i didn't tell true but um is that really around the establishment of, of of a department of democracy and that's a longer issue that i'll talk about later but we've got to put in some additional support to strengthen democracy even the the, the voting rights act was a compromise y'all it was never enough and so what we're seeing is we're seeing the actual fragility of democracy we're seeing an anti-democracy movement um and we're, we have to respond in force so thank you miles for the opportunity and i'm really honored to be here in this space uh, with you both, Nan and Tamika. No, this is, uh, well, this has been extraordinary. So I really want to thank all of you. Um, and, I, and I think there's a yin and a yang here that came across really, really clearly, which is that democracy is under, is under threat. Yeah. There are forces in this country, call it the shadow of the plantation, but call it, or, or call it reaction, it's going to try to push us back because it is clear that democracy is headed toward a new day. Um, and on the other hand, there is that movement. I just take incredible, incredible heart from the work that's going on to um, organize people for power, to organize and communities of color, to, to, to build ongoing organizations. I really like your term, Tamika, integrated voter engagement. It's about building organizations. And I think that the Kennedy School at our best uh, should be a contributor to that movement and try to make sure that the voices of that movement are heard and that it is given kind of intellectual and, and, uh, and public support. And uh, as we head into 2021, that will be an important uh, message for us to take. So anyway, I wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. The video is available. If you wanna, if, if you wanna let your friends know that they ought to be watching, um, uh, I, I wouldn't quite call it a musical performance, but it had a little music in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, tell them to go to the uh, to the YouTube channel of the Ash Center. So thanks everybody very much. We will see you all in 2021. Nan, Tamika, Latasha, this was fabulous. I really, really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Right. Bye. Bye, Tamika.